You know, my era of the NBA is the 90s. Oh, the most beautiful time. The league was a league for men. If you couldn't play, you got fished out real quickly and um, you were up out of there. You were playing in, in, in uh, Germany, China, your backyard, whatever the case. And that 90s era has so many legendary players, iconic players. And every iconic player was not a superstar. You had iconic role players. You had iconic six men. You know, the, the third, fourth, fifth option was a hell of a player. You know, when you look at like the mid-90s Bulls, when you get to that, you know, 96, 97, 98, obviously Jordan, Pippen, Rodman. But Luke Longley was a hell of a center. He fit his role beautifully. You know, Steve Kerr was, was a tremendous role player. Ron Harper. A lot of people, they think of Ron Harper as he was the other guard in the backcourt of Jordan. You know, they think of him as, you know, he was the point guard on the Lakers when, you know, early 2000s with Phil Jackson came over. Most people don't realize or don't remember or didn't see Ron Harper was nice way before he got to Chicago. When he was in Cleveland, he was an all-star type player. There were actually people comparing him to Michael Jordan. There are people when he was young saying Ron Harper could be the next Jordan. Now, the that comparison is absurd, but that's a whole nother story. The the never-ending look for a new Michael Jordan. It, it truly tells you how great... He was when they're obsessively looking for the new version of him for the last 40 years. When he's playing, they were looking for him. Who's the next Jordan? Who's the next Jordan? Please. I actually have a, I have a video on this channel where I actually answered that question. And I said who the next Jordan is. Look up that video. And it's not who you think. I actually broke down who the next Jordan actually was. And that player already came and went. And he had a hell of a career. And... I guarantee it's someone you're not thinking of. Look that video up on the channel. Hit the like button. Share this video. Subscribe to this channel. But Ron Harper was a hell of a player. He was nice. And, you know, he, he was in Cleveland. He, he was a hell of a player. And then eventually he went to the Clippers. And when he was in the Clippers, this is the 90s, the Clippers was garbage. See, I don't know how old a lot of the people watching are. The Clippers, you probably, if, if you know, if you grew up in the last... If you grew up watching the NBA in the last 10 years, 15 years, you don't know the Clippers being an embarrassment. The Clippers you know is Blake Griffin when he was healthy, you know, Jamal Crawford, you know, Chris Paul. You know the Doc Rivers Clippers. You didn't see the horrible Danny Manning Clippers. You didn't see the horrible mid-90s Clippers. You didn't see the Clippers that were so bad they had to get Michael Olo Candy, who was even more trash. You don't remember them Clippers. The Clippers were an embarrassment for most of their history. The Donald Sterling eras, good Lord. And Ron Harper was there, and Ron Harper, and many people don't know, Ron Harper actually had a stuttering problem. And uh, he overcame that to a great degree. And uh, that's just a little, you know, you know, uh, I guess a uh, tidbit or whatever. But um, Ron Harper, he, he went to the Clippers to play, and... When he left L.A. and went to Chicago, he did an interview on NBC, the NBA on NBC, when they had, you know, Bob Costas and Peter Vesey. Peter Vesey, you talk about a dick licker. You talk about somebody who, who deserves a bullet to the back of the head. I don't know how he did not get his backside whooped. I don't know how. I'm trying to monitor the cuss words. But uh, Ron Harper did an interview with Peter Vesey, and he was saying that when he was on the Clippers, it was miserable. The players did not care about playing. The players were lazy, and in turn, it made him lazy and not care. He would be late to games, late to practice. You know, Peter Vesey had the nerve to say Ron Harper was faking injuries. Peter, if you don't know, if you don't know who Peter Vesey is, be glad you don't. He's a piece of trash, typical media garbage. Skip Bayless, he's Skip, he's Skip Bayless type, a Jason Whitlock type of the '90s. But um, Ron Harper. 
and even in the interview, he he admits that you know he knows how good he was in Cleveland, but he came to Chicago because he was tired of being in a situation where they did not love the game, and it took away his love of the game being on the Clippers. So when he came to Chicago, he did come to Chicago, you know, with the same mindset that he had in L.A., and he was out of shape actually, and he had to play himself into shape. And if you play with the Bulls and Jordan and the way they did things, you were gonna have to shape up or you get shipped out. So. Obviously, he did that, and, you know, the Bulls went on to win 96, 97, 98. And Ron Harper had a tremendous career. And in that run, you get the 72-10 and 10 Bulls, and in that year, they faced the tremendous Seattle Supersonics. And if I'm not mistaken, Seattle, I think that year, didn't Seattle win like 69 games or something crazy? They had a crazy record. Um... I can't even remember. Let me let me see that real quick. Actually, uh, what what was the record they had in Seattle that year? Seattle SuperSonics, nineteen ninety six. Let me see record. Okay, it's okay. It said they were sixty four and eighteen. So Seattle had a tremendous team that year. Ninety five, ninety six. George Carl, that that fool, that monkey. But um, cannot stand George Carl. I, I might have to have some content on him. And that Seattle team, you know, another classic team from my childhood. Um, the classic jerseys. Oh, my God. I love the 90s NBA jerseys. And they had a hell of a roster. Gary Payton, obviously the superstar. Nate McMillan, good role player. Irvin Johnson, the other Irvin. Hershey Hawkins. Oh, my God. Hershey Hawkins, tremendous player. Sean Kemp, obviously iconic. A young Eric, Eric Snow was a rookie. David Wingate. Detlef Shrimp was nice. Sam Perkins. Um, another UNC alum. And um, next to Michael Jordan. They had a hell of a team. But they did not have the team to beat the Bulls. And when you look at a lot of people, and I had to realize this, when you look at a lot of older people, who will talk against Michael Jordan, they're delusional and they're sensitive, butthurt males. You have to understand that. A lot of these older people, if you're young, I expect you to be dumb and, and dick lick LeBron. But a lot of the older people who grew up in the 70s and 80s and 90s NBA, when they start talking against Jordan and they start worshiping LeBron, it's because in the 90s, you were a Knicks fan and your Knicks could not get past Jordan. It was because you kept rooting for Jordan to lose and he never would. That's what it is. It's a lot of butthurt males in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, and older. Mad because your team could not get past Jordan. It's a lot of angry, bad boy Pistons fans that are deriding LeBron James. And that's what I had to realize when it comes to the older audience. The younger audience... They don't know nothing and they'll listen to whatever people tell them. That's that's what it is. It's as simple as that. And back in the 90s, back in the 70s, back in the 80s, early 2000s, this game really meant something. So players took it personal when they lost. They weren't hugging and kissing and exchanging jerseys and swapping nail polish or, or wives. As far as I know, um, maybe Rodman, but to this day, Carl Malone, you could see the hurt in his face whenever, if you ask, Carl Malone does not even like to say the name Jordan. Carl Malone is still emotional over losing twice. John Stockton, not so much. Jeff Hornacek, not so much. Gary Payton and Sean Kemp, they're not emotional but they have the delusion still. You can find clip after clip after clip, even in the last dance, Gary Payton and Sean Kemp have convinced themselves mentally, we could have beat the Bulls in 96. They're delusional. Well, if if, I, if they just put me on Michael, you know, they, they, they waited too late to put me on Michael. If I would have guarded Michael, Gary Payton's a great defender, great one of the greatest players. He could not stop Michael Jordan. Sean Kemp was a hell of a player. Sean Kemp, 
he was not going to do enough to help them get over the hump of the Bulls. But that delusion happens. I like Gary Payton, but he is still delusional, and so is Sean Kemp. They're doing interviews to this day. We could have beat the Bulls in 96 if we just did this and this and this. All the this and this and this would have never worked. Because first of all, it wasn't, first of all, you're, you, you're not going to beat Jordan in the finals. Jordan in June, he was a killer. You're not beating him. And it wasn't just him. You have to beat the mind of Phil Jackson. You have to beat the mind of Tex Winter. And Seattle, they had a hell of a team. But their role players did not match up with the Bulls. Hershey Hawkins, Sam Perkins, Detlef Shrimp, they don't compare to Pippen, Rodman, Kerr, Tony Kukoc. They could not compare to the Bulls' role players. Their system was not as tight as the Bulls' system was offensively with the triangle or defensively. But this is a real thing. There are some people in life, they just cannot move on and they will, uh, they will attach delusion. Well, I could have done this. If we just did this, there was nothing they could have done. The only way they would have beat the Bulls is if Jordan put on a Sonics jersey in the series. And with that said, I'm up out of here. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and that is it.